I think both of them are here. I'd like to ask both of them to come up. Uh, Rob Benfield and Brian, come up, please. Y'all have a seat, if you would. This is a bill sponsored by me and others. The purpose of it is to look at the question of whether or not in a historic district, when there is vacant property, the uh, question arises to the ability of someone to have the opportunity to develop that property uh, pursuant to what may be certainly the, the local government's uh, zoning regulations, development standards, and even covenants that may apply to the property. Yes, sir. And uh, I'm aware there has been for some time litigation for two years. This bill has been uh, in this committee on various forms. I have held up even going forward with a full committee hearing about it, but it's got to the point I understand this litigation just doesn't stop. So I wanted to hear from the attorneys about it, and I'll allow whoever is the plaintiff attorney to talk first. Who's Who would be the plaintiff? Mr. Benfield. Uh, All right, sir. The Mr. petitioner. Um, petitioner. Um, thank you, Chan uh, Chairman Willard. Uh, indeed, this bill, this very bill, has been before this very committee for the last two sessions, 2011-2012. It's been referred to as the Local Rule Historic Preservation Disabling Bill, and, and that is because that's exactly what it does. Um, it's, uh, as you all know, the Historic Preservation Enabling uh, legislation has been in place for two decades. And, and what it does, it says to local government, cities and counties, it doesn't dictate, it doesn't direct, but it says you're, you're empowered, you're enabled to pass historic preservation ordinances and set up historic preservation commissions as to two things, sites and structures, historic sites and structures. Um, and, and it does so because the local governments, the cities, and the counties are in the best, they, they know these properties, they know the area, they're in the best position to, to protect them, to take whatever <coughs> uh, measures are necessary locally to, to, uh, to, to address the issues. What House Bill 474 does, it guts half of the historic preservation enabling legislation. It says that if there is a site with no structure on it, such as a battlefield, in our case, a, a neighborhood with historic lot lines that were drawn by Frederick Law Olmsted and, and, and other, other land of the like without a structure, that there can be no historic preservation ordinance, no historic preservation commission, no historic oversight of it. And secondly, even if there is a, um, a structure, but the grounds are more than one lot or more than one parcel, it only relates to the lot or parcel that, that particular structure is on. So th this is this historic preservation enabling act that has been in place for two decades and has never been amended and has never been changed without the input of the historic preservation community. This will be a first. And the question is, why would it be done now? Why would it be? Why would it pass today, out of committee? Um, uh, we were very grateful for Chairman Willard's uh, principled stance over the last two sessions that uh, this committee would pass no legislation simply to influence the outcome of one piece of pending civil litigation. Nothing has changed. Two years ago, the issue is whether or not uh, the developer, and he's here today, Mr. Buckler, and his attorney is here today, whether or not uh, the DeKalb County Planning Commission could subdivide property without the Historic Preservation Commission granting it a COA. Let me ask this. I know you're going through a history of it. As I understand, the property has been approved through the Planning Commission process, which has oversight of the plan, the preliminary site plan, plat, and they've received the land disturbance permit. It's now, did they receive those correctly through the local ordinance requirements? That's that's what's being litigated. That's what was being litigated well, two years ago. And, and, and I understand y'all dismissed that lawsuit. It was voluntarily dismissed yes, and, and rebrought due to a pro procedural issue. 
uh, to correct that. And that's coming up for a hearing, you say, March 18th? March 18th, yes, okay. sir. And uh, is it your motions that are pending on March 18th, or is it? There are a variety of motions. There, there, there are motions by the petitioner. There's motions by the defendant. There are several other motions out there. It is, uh, uh, there have been 10 lawsuits over the last 10 decades, most of which have been brought by Mr. Buckler and his partner. Um, there have been three appellate decisions. And uh, the very issue that's being litigated, and I'm, I'm quoting from the case of DeKalb County versus Buckler, a published appellate decision. Um, on the second page it says, certificates of appropriateness are necessary to alter lot lines within the Drew Hills Historic District. It doesn't get more specific than that. Uh, but, but, but that's being litigated again. Now in front of the Superior Court and, and uh, Chairman Willard, you're absolutely correct on As I look at lot lines, they come in as a result of the plat being recorded and covenants addressing the, the plat with the use of the property, correct? Uh, this this particular case standpoint. dealt with the subdivision. That's why lot lines were being altered. That's are there covenants that apply to this property that are currently active? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. There are not. Uh, Let me hear from, from you, sir. Give us your name. And uh, my name is Brian Dodrell, and I do represent Mr. Buckler. I, I brought with me copies for uh, the committee of the case that Mr. Benfield is referencing. And if you look at it, any first-year lawyer can tell you, when you are reviewing at an appellate level a motion for summary judgment, you can strew all facts in favor of the non-moving party. Um, if you look at the paragraph Mr. Benfield cites, the court is saying, construed in favor of respondents, respondents being the county at that time, these facts are, are deemed true. That is not a holding, it's not even dicta. Uh, if that was an argument that was made in court, Mr. Benfield would be subject to sanctions. As to this particular uh, project, um, DeKalb County has not designated this property a site and site is a defined term. It could have been designated a site, but it wasn't. Um, this. What, what does it mean to be designated a site? If you have something, for instance, a particular battlefield, there are provisions for designating that particular property because of the uh, historic event that occurred on the site. You can designate it a site as opposed to uh, their attempt to designate this a historic district. Um, as to the comment about this litigate or this uh, legislation affecting litigation, as you know, this legislation is not uh, retroactive. It doesn't go back and undo what has already happened. We have received planning commission approval of our sketch plat, which is the preliminary plat. We've received public works approval of the land disturbance permit. The zoning board of appeals has refused an appeal of that land disturbance permit. We have a hearing on the 18th, and that hearing is on all issues remaining pending. And one of the main issues that remains pending is our motion to dismiss that lawsuit as a failed attempt to renew a void petition. That petition, as you know, a petition for writ of certiorari is a very limited appeal. It's limited to the record. Uh, Judge Hancock determined what the record was, and they dismissed. And only when we filed our land disturbance permit and had been the application had been pending for almost six weeks. Did they renew this as an attempt to try to further delay this project? Has there been work done on the premises under the land disturbance permit? Yes, sir. Yes, we had commenced work <laughs> under the land disturbance permit. There's a temporary restraining order in effect. Brought by you from? It was actually issued sua sponte by the trial court and has been extended sua sponte by the trial court on, on its own. Okay. It, Hearing it, it was brought based on an emergency motion Mr. Benfield filed. Though. Okay. Um, it, it appears from Mr. Daldrell's statements, just briefly, and, and, and all respect intended, that Mr. Daldrell intends to prevail on the 18th, hands down. And so um, with that forecast, it would appear there's nothing for this committee to do. Um, but I would, uh, I, I would hearken to... Chairman Willard's remarks, uh, principled remarks that were made in the last two years that this committee should undertake no legislation simply to fix litigation for one person in principle in well, civil litigation. Is how long is this going to be litigated? <laughs> it's well, been going, what, 10 years? There have been three Since appellate decisions. There have been 10 cases, mostly filed by Mr. Buckler, 
and there's a hearing where all things will be determined according to the judge on March 18th. All right. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Oliver? Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure how you wish us to uh, answer, ask questions at this time, but if I may, is Go it ahead. true, sir, that when Mr. Buckler bought this property, he knew it was a historic preservation district? It is true that when Mr. Buckler bought this property, he knew it was in litigation. We do not contend it is a historic district, and that's been an issue that's been raised previously. Uh, do you contest that it is a historic preservation commission designated area? I, I'm not sure I understand your question because the Historic Preservation Commission doesn't designate an area. The Board of Commissioners do. Do you contest that the DeKalb County Board of Commissioners has designated this as a historic Yes. Okay. You do contest that? Yes, ma'am. That, that was appellate decision two, you know, okay. case number so you, five. So you, you don't believe that he knew this was in a historic preservation commission area when he bought this property? I, I don't, don't, since it was in active litigation when it was purchased, I don't believe there's any dispute that we knew that it was contended. So it would be fair to say that he had some suspicion that there was a Historic Preservation Commission designated and there was active litigation when he bought it. There's also suspicion that the ordinances of DeKalb County would be enforced in an even and fair manner. So he intended to litigate when he bought the property? Like I said, the property was in active litigation when it was purchased. And he has held forth with that position of litigation since he bought the property? He is still trying to exercise his private property rights to develop the property. Yes, ma'am. All right. Any other questions? Anything you want to add further? We're going to be on a little bit of a short time, but uh, go si ahead. S simply this, and I've, I've had a handout. Many of you have historic preservation districts uh, in, in your own district. You have many historic preservation organizations and historic societies. Uh, you may have been contacted by, by some of them. Um, there are 138 historic preservation districts in this state. This bill is about one private litigant. Um, <clears throat> those 138 historic preservation districts should not be tossed out the window, thrown on the bus for one piece of private litigation. Right. Uh, Chairman Willie, very quickly. Um, as you know, uh, Representative McKillop last year sponsored the bill because the same issue came up in Athens. Of the 131, we polled more than a dozen. Uh, in the last week, we polled Cobb, Ackworth, Douglasville, Forsyth, Marietta, Roswell, Savannah, Thomasville, Madison, Brunswick, and Decatur. None of those districts or none of those uh, jurisdictions attempt to use historic preservation to control simple division of vacant land by way of subdivision ordinances. Um, the Department of Natural Resources, uh, Mark Williams, the commissioner, issued a letter, and I just told the place as uh, well. Um, and in that letter, Mr. Williams opined that to expand the Historic Preservation Act to try to authorize uh, the conduct of these, you know, two or three renegade. HPCs is not authorized by state law. Uh, the property that's at issue, and I think that's one thing, you know, the practical side of it that you look at, the property that's at issue, this subdivision, um, the lots that surround it on average are 0.47 acres. The average lot size of the lots that we're putting in are larger, they're half an acre. There are lots directly across the street from this property that are a quarter of an acre, and our smallest lot is three tenths of an acre. So, you know, this is not something that is dramatically out of keeping with the property that surrounds it. Um, All right. Mr. Fleming? Mr. Chairman, I got this list of cities here. And city number 56, 72, and 131, I all represent, and they all have historic districts. I'm trying to figure out how what we're doing here is going to affect them. What exactly are we being asked to do here, and what is this going to do to the historic districts in my area? This will do nothing to the historic districts in your area. The only thing that would be impacted by this legislation is a clarification of the point that where you have vacant, undeveloped land that is in a historic district, it hasn't been designated a site, that simple subdivision of the land itself, just the sketch plat part, the, the preliminary plat and the final plat, 
would not be subject to historic preservation review. That is the general understanding of most of the jurisdictions, like I said, that I polled. It is not how DeKalb is operating. Well, let me ask you this question. In my hometown, we have a historic district. Mm -hmm. And there, those historic districts generally have certain lot sizes. You know, you, you could drive down the street and the lot's about this big, lot's about this big, lot's about this big. Now, if somebody wanted to come up there and do post-stamp lots, it wouldn't fit within the historic that's district. Exactly. But you would be subject to a separate set of regulations under zoning, and that's the situation that we have here. The zoning for this property, the lots that we're putting in, are fully zoning compliant. They require no variances. There are no reductions of lot sizes, and they are, as I just pointed out, larger than all of the other lots on average than the 35 lots that front the road that we're on. So this would not be a situation that you're describing because your underlying zoning there would still govern the size of the lots that could be developed. Representative Fleming, let me, let me see if I can answer your question. I know one of the things you want to do is be able to talk to those historic preservation districts to know whether or not this would have an impact. Obviously, there's not an opportunity to do that today, but I think I can address your question. Um, the lots in the Druid Hills Historic Preservation District were initially laid out in the late 1800s by Frederick L. Olmsted. He is the same person that, that designed the grounds of the Capitol, designed Central Park, laid out the Biltmore Gardens. This is the only neighborhood in the southeast that he laid out. There were no zoning laws then. And the, the, the unique shape contours of these lots, they are large lots. They are narrow lots. They are very deep lots. And just like in your historic district, you can look at them, and there is a pattern you can see. But, but zoning laws that came about in DeKalb County in the 1950s don't have a category for these uniquely narrow, deep, large lots laid out by Frederick Law Olmsted, the Olmsted brothers, and subsequently their engineers. But you're right. You look down the road and you can see those. What Mr. Buckler, the private developer here, wants to put in to shoehorn into the Druid Hills Historic District is from these three large, narrow, deep lots, he wants to shoehorn in these square lots that you're talking about with a cul-de-sac. If you can do that for these lots in Druid Hills, you can march it right down the street, and you will no longer have the neighborhood that Frederick Law Olmsted right. designed in the southeast mm -hmm. with the curvilinear streets, with the ancient hardwood canopy. You're going to have, you know, <laughs> these other cookie-cutter, slice-and-dice, cul-de-sac right. development. But you'll no longer have the crown and the jewel of not just DeKalb County, but Georgia <clears throat> and the country. Well, we're on short time. Let me have another person to speak. Uh, Mr. Weldon, the tourist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what you guys are, and I'm not, I don't know about the 10 lawsuits and all that stuff. I hadn't been engaged in reading all that. In Fort Oglethorpe, which is my district, there's the, uh, there's a place, it's called the Polo Fields. And there's, this is kind of, it's kind of role reversal if you guys would, you know, it'd be you'd be representing the city, and you'd be representing uh, some some individuals that live on that. And I think it, what their problem is with what you want to do is exactly what he just articulated: is you can't put a square lot in here and expect it to reflect the the neighborhood. Correct. But but let me just I just want to make sure I got your your argument and your argument is well that's not the point because we bought this property and we're subject to the rules of zoning and and and, and that's what we're trying to comply with and we've done that and accordingly we should be able to develop it. That is partially correct. Uh, we first of all these are not square lots, uh, but second of all um, the property. You know, the concern that's being expressed about rolling down the street, there is not a historic structure on this property. There is not an architectural feature on this property. There's not a landscaping feature on this property. It is vacant, undeveloped land. So this is something that is none of those characteristics are something that are being affected by this. If you have 
an existing historic district with existing historic houses in it, and somebody came in, as Mr. Benfield suggested, and tried to roll down the street assembling properties, you would run headlong into the fact that every one of those historic houses that you were trying to demolish would be subject to HPC review. That's not the case here. We have vacant, undeveloped land, and this bill addresses okay. that point. Okay, I think I understand. You. And, and so, was that when you say vacant, un undeveloped land, was it? Uh, was there somebody mowing it? Was it? Were the trees just growing? You know, as the wind blew the it, seeds out it, there? there. There was a house on it. It straddled two lots, and it was demolished. So this this was not originally vacant land. Uh, um, but Representative there, there, Powell had an issue uh, last year, and uh, one of your concerns, Representative Powell, I recall, was 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 battle, battlefields. If it's vacant land, like many battlefields are, but there are different parcels or lots, this this amendment would allow the subdivision. It would allow no more supervision of uh, or oversight, um, if even if a battlefield is a historic preservation district. Um, <coughs> And I know that's a concern also for, um, uh, I think it's Fort, Fort Oglethorpe. Is it, is it? All right. 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 We're limited time-wise. I'm going to terminate further debate on the bill. I appreciate you being here this morning. It's down the breast of the committee. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Make your motion. Let's make a motion to table. Motion is to table. We have a motion and a second. There's no further debate on a motion to table. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Mine is table. Thank you for being here. the next one we have. Let's get, uh, no, I'm going to do, Mr. Mr. Smyre, come on up, please, sir. I'll get you in, out of here because you're fairly quick. Well, that was a little TV court right there. The cameraman here, Mr. Chairman, go on TV. Sell tickets, huh? We're on uh, House Bill 506. Mr. Smyrie, glad to have you with us. Good to be back twice. I have been here in a long time, not two times. And, um, you know, they always said these one-page bills cause you more time than anything. This is a very simple bill, but it's not simple for Columbus and our Ch Chattahoochee circuit. Uh, our judges want to change the method of election of the chief judge. It's been on continuous, longest continuous service. Now they want to go to a majority of the judges that are sitting. Yes, sir. And we had this, to bring the committee up to date, we had this as a part of the bill that is also creating the additional judgeship in Chattahoochee Circuit and in the uh, uh, Oconee Circuit. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, the concern is those provi that provision in that bill will not take place until sometime later, correct? That is correct because we, we – the budget and everything is, is corresponding um, material with 451 maybe, and maybe January. May, right. Maybe January, and, uh, so and our judges have already done this, so we're trying to play catch up to keep up. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any further, any comments or requests of uh, the committee of Mr. Smyre? If there being none, we'll close off debate. No one else here to speak on that bill, is there? Thank you. It's on 506. This is all a new section. It is a new. It's not a line. It's all a new section. It applies only to the Chattahoochee Judicial Circuit, and it's for the purpose of having a uh, election of the chief judge by the judges of the circuit. There's five of them currently. The six current, and we added the seventh. Adding a seventh, excuse me. Is the motion going to make It is. Second. Move and second it. Any further discussion on the motion? Any amendments? There being none, the chair will call the main question. All in favor signify. 
Uh, passes 506 uh, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed like sign. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. See you all next year. <laughs> Let's get Miss Sheldon up here. Miss Sheldon, are you in? You ready to come up, please? On House Bill 499. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, hopefully, I'll follow Chairman Smy or Representative Smyrie's lead here. Unanimous pass was great. Yeah. Um, well, today I bring before you House Bill um, 499, and also have a substitute that you should have. It's um, LC 5152S. Uh, that's the substitute. We will 5152S. That's correct. Okay, that's, that's the one in our folders. Perfect. Um, well, House Bill 499, I bring to you for consideration largely, largely in response to provisions in the Affordable Care Act. Um, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, there were provisions that would allow a physician to be held liable for medical malpractice if they were found in breach of administrative standards. Um, some of these provisions are based on payments and others are based on quality control measures. Neither of these involve the actual practice of medicine. Therefore, I believe that mal medical malpractice is not what is actually committed. This bill does not provide an extra layer of immunity and is not about char and is about charging individuals appropriately. Um, if you were to break into a house and still you had someone breaking your house and steal your furniture, you could file a cause of action against them based on breaking and entering, larceny, and probably uh, treason, trespassing. But you cannot say that they committed assault or battery and false imprisonment. Uh, the language in this bill just and try clarifies that uh, medical malpractice would not be uh, related to administrative procedures. If you'll look at the bill um, on lines 11, um, we de clearly define that um, the criteria sh um, shall be related to administrative procedures and shall not include criteria relating to medical treatment. The same will be found in line 13, um, does not relate, it's not related to medical treatment. And then for standard down in line 21, it's also related, uh, standards shall not include standards relating to medical treatment. Um, in section B, or per, sub, subsection B, um, talks about, um, basically this is, I guess, kind of the, um, what's good for the goose is good for the gander clause, and it says that if it's not admissible for negligence, um, then it's not admissible for compliance either. Um, and also have some other individuals that are here to testify on the bill. All right, we have signed up uh, Donald Basmano. Where's I'll excuse me, I miss that every time. Donald, I'm sorry. Come on up, please. Yes, sir, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. I'm Donald Pomazano. I'm the Executive Director of the Medical Association of Georgia, and uh, I'm here to answer any questions that y'all may have about the bill. Uh, one of the things is that in the Affordable Care Act, as it was going through the process back in 2010, in the House version of the bill, this language was, the similar language was in the bill that said, because they didn't, it was never the intention for the Affordable Care Act to be laying out the standard of care. However, when the election happened in Massachusetts, Senate bill came over. The Senate bill didn't have this provision in there. And so what happened is the Senate bill passes. So now you've got this bit of a potential quagmire that could end up having the federal <coughs> government or, you know, or uh, CMS basically dictating what could be the standards of care. And so we've worked with the trial attorneys on this. Um, we both have some concerns with the bill, but we've agreed to for purposes of bringing it to y'all today, to agree to what's here, and, and you know, and just continue to work the bill through the process. <coughs> and so, with that, I can answer any questions that you may have. Questions for Mr. Palmisano, Representative Oliver. The trial lawyers and um, medical defense folks have done a very good job this session on a lot of different issues. This looks to me way more complicated than something I was prepared to really understand this morning. When you say that you're going to work on it, I don't know, I don't know how, whether y'all are still working on an agreement or whether that means you're working on a fight or whether you're working on... Agreement. Um, this, this is a fairly <coughs> big deal is what I'm saying to myself. 
but but what can I give you an example of yeah. what this bill would 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 work was working towards? Um, okay, in, in 2006, you had the Deficit Reduction Act that passed. Okay, in the Deficit Reduction Act, you have what's called hospital acquired conditions. Essentially, it's a payment method. So, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services will not pay for certain things. Okay, one of which is a urinary tract infection that's the result of a catheter and the inpatient stay within a hospital. You're, you're telling me exactly what I've, my fear was, is that they're, they're go moving towards an outcome-based payment system. Correct. And this deals with the outcome-based payment system that is set forth in the new Affordable Health Care Act. Am I correct about that generally? Generally. And, and just to, in, in, in that example with the UTI, C, uh, CMS recognizes that uh, maybe only 25% of the time those things are avoidable. So you've got 75% of the time up to that it may not be avoidable, but yet they're not going to pay for it. So they look, what CMS and what the federal government and what you're having a lot of these payers doing is they're looking for things that are high volume and what they term as, you know, reasonably shouldn't happen. But when you've got a standard that's set so low at 25%, I mean, I think we can all agree that's not negligence. That's a payment standard. So the payer's saying, we don't want to pay for this. So the standard of care should always be dictated by if it's against a physician, against the physicians. If it's against the dentist, it's against the dentist. Should be those that in, who who know this area and who practice in this area, and so that's all this bill is doing. It's not changing anything. It's maintaining the status quo moving forward, so that what you don't have is the federal government. You don't have CMS coming in and saying or private payers. Well, we're not going to pay for this. Well, then it should be admitted into. May doubt. I ask one further question, Mr. Chairman? Just one. <clears throat> to the extent certain parts of the medical community are opposing. Uh, Affordable Health Care Act on this issue. I'm trying to figure out whether or not this bill is part of a, a uniform national opposition to affordable health care because this is an issue that is very controversial and what I mean is outcome based payment system is controversial and there's a lot of opposition. Is that what this bill is about? Is it <coughs> opposing affordable health care? No it's not. No, it's, it, that's not the intention of it. The intention of it is to say, look, whatever's coming down from federal guidelines um, and what may be adopted by private payers on payment issues are not dictate, should not dictate what is the standard of care. And because it's never been done that way before. However, where payment methods are going, you start running into that slippery slope where they could be interpreted to say, well, you know, this is the standard of care. And, uh, you know, this bill was being run uh, at the federal level uh, with, uh, uh, Representative Phil Gingrich uh, was pushing it, but also that I think there was bipartisan support on that. So it, it's recognized that that was never the intent um, when when PPACA was moving through the process to have these standards um, or these payments being determinative of what is the standard of care. All right, we've got a lot of lights on and two more people signed up to speak on the bill. I'll take these in the order that I saw them. Chairman Weldon. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'm going to waive at this point. Thank you. Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is, what section of the Affordable Care <coughs> Act is it that you're concerned with and so that I can look it up on my own? And then if you could tell me a little bit about what the actual language in the federal law is that you're concerned about. In, in the House bill, it was uh, section, I think it was 261, <coughs> but that bill did not pass. That's where this was going to be addressed, okay? In the Senate bill, it wasn't in there. Some things in the federal bill, um, like hospital-acquired conditions, were initially, they came out of the Deficit Reduction Act for Medicare in 2006. By virtue of the, uh, by the Affordable Care Act, they were applied to Medicaid um, in 2010 through that act. If I could, but was it actually passed as part of the law? And if it was, you should be able to give me a code section. And if it's not, then I don't know what the problem is. I can pull those code sections for you. I don't have the explicit code section. Yeah, I, I, I would like to have the code sections. And if you could tell me what the code section says okay, specifically. Deals, because specific, um, I can get you those code sections, but it deals with hospital-based uh, value purchasing, value payment modifiers, things like that. But what is the language that you think causes the problem that you're trying to address in House Bill 499? I'm not clear. Well... It's in, it, the language itself, it, it's all the, the movement to these new payment systems that are resulting. And so it's to say these payment systems are not determined of the standard of care. So it's a concern about where you think it might be headed, but not a concern with the actual language in the 
in the act doing what you think it does. Is that what I'm hearing you say? There's concern in the act, yes. Um, in fact, if you give me, I can pull up certain sections real quick. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll allow you to do that while we move on to the next question, or if that's okay. That's Representative okay. Maber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a quick question. When we're dealing with the Affordable Care Act here and the payment systems, and I understand that, but uh, we're blending lines here and wanted to see. I, th I think, you know, if a situation does come up, we're limiting evidence uh, that could go to helping patients. And it's the whole, this, the whole Affordable Care Act is about patients, and I think we're sort of limiting some of the things here and you're talking about the payment system well if a doctor has got some type of system in which it's affecting uh, the way uh, he's conducting medical treatment and uh, the way he's doing the quality of care and best practice practices in his office I think it, it's evidence that needs to come out and so the jury can determine that um, and so I wanted to get your take on why uh, this bill is necessary to to limit evidence that will go before a jury on how offices run, not per se the the payments, the actual money, but if he's having a hundred people come through to make money, I think it's reasonable to have evidence to say, hey, he has a hundred people coming through with a staff of three to make money, and it appears that this language might limit that type of evidence for coming in. I would like to say, you know, I think uh, the important thing here is, you know, we're talking about um, changing the way they're charged, you know, for malpractice and for other things. It needs to be based on the actual care. Um, it doesn't need to be expanded. Currently, the, the state of Georgia, we have our standards for medical malpractice, and I don't know that today's the time, you know, we need to be allowing um, the federal government to be bringing in additional guidelines. On, and this is really about, when we think of medical mal malpractice, we think about um, doctors, you know, there are, um, it's not about payment. It's not about different quality measures. It's not about how um, the system determines whether they're going to pay for something or not. I think that's outside of the purview of what medical malpractice is. I think it definitely expands that. Chairman Powell. I can actually oh. answer the question. All right. What well, was go, previously asked. Go ahead. Um, specific, uh, specific sections. These uh, sections do not um, authorize or prohibit uh, the evidence from being um, uh, put into uh, medical malpractice issues, but you look at uh, Section 3001, Hospital Value-Based Purchase Programs, uh, Section 3002, Improvements on Physician Quality Reporting Initiatives. You know, none of these don't authorize or preclude the issuance or, of such rules and regulations for establishing liability, but they can be interpreted as to doing that. Uh, Value-based modifier, Section 3007, uh, Payment Adjustments for co uh, Conditions Acquired in Hospitals, Section 3008. And so there, there's multiple sections in there. But that's what we were looking at and saying those are not determinative of the standard of care. And that was never the intent of, of the ACA. What it was is that should, the standard should be with what is uh, with the physicians or the dentist or whoever is being sued. Representative Evans, do you have a follow-up? If I could, Juan, yes, thank you. If the language of the bill, I mean the language of the code sections that you just named, you've just stated that they don't prohibit the evidence. You're just concerned that they would be interpreted that way. What is it about the language that makes you think they would be interpreted that way if the language doesn't say that and if you know it was not anyone's intent for it to do that? Because in the House version that did not pass, this language that would prohibit <coughs> any of these payment methods from being introduced into evidence was there. That section is no longer there because on the Senate version that passed, it was not, that language was not in the Senate version. It did not pass. It did not pass. Thank you. Chairman Powell. Whoop. I'd like to add two, if I may. I, have, um, I do have a letter here signed by several of the congressmen, um, basically to, to Chairman Waxman and explaining that, you know, the language in H.R. 3962 did um, provide the provisions and the protections that we're talking about, in, but similar to 499, and, but there was no language in the final passage, and there are definitely some concerns. Um, it says, this means that not only would physicians delivering personalized care to the physician patients potentially risk losing reimbursement for delivery of care, they could also face risk, increased risk of liability for using their own professional judgment based on the care needs of their patients, and that, that does not follow nationally published practice care, practice and care guidelines. I'd be glad to give you a copy if you'd like that. Chairman Powell. Correct me if I'm wrong, but 
my understanding of what you're saying is is that under Georgia law, that in order to do a medical malpractice, I have to have competent expert testimony as to the standard of care and that it violates the standard of care. And you are concerned that payment standards could then somehow be blended in and, and be grafted on. And so this bill says that without expert testimony as to the standard of care, that payment standards cannot be introduced into evidence. That's correct. As evidence of, of malpractice. And on the contrary, that if I met the payment standards, that that's not proof that I did not commit medical malpractice. So it's, it's fairly balanced that it cannot be used in either direction. That's correct. That we're just preserving what the scheme under Georgia law is, is that you've got to have a standard of care, you've got to have expert testimony to produce that before you can do a mal medical malpractice claim. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Representative Fleming. In the interest of time, I think I understand what Representative Powell just mentioned. And, and for smart lawyers, you're exactly right. For the rest of us, this is our first attempt to keep Obamacare from fa affecting and changing Georgia's law. Is that not correct? Thank you. Representative Welch. Is there a concern here that we were essentially creating a negligence per se standard by utilizing these guidelines to substitute for that expert testimony? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I don't want to create that. I don't want to create that hurdle in a trial by using guidelines that are meant for determining the best method of payment or the best procedure or the most cost-effective procedure, <coughs> which is part of the intent of the Affordable Care Act. I don't want to create that presumption in a tort liability case that isn't directed at necessarily the, the best standard of care for that particular situation, but what is most cost effective. And so I think that's we're, we're looking at bean counting versus the doctor's best opinion. And I, I think we're going to marry those two things if we don't pass this legislation. And that would be contrary to what we want to achieve in a jury trial when examining the, uh, the the medical care that was given to a patient um, and whether or not that was appropriate. That's my concern with, and that's why I think this is good legislation. We got to get moving on because we got rules of nine and several of us need to be up in rules on bills too. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. I just wanted to see the letter from Congress. Thank you. Okay. You have yours too, Mr. Weldon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Mr. Palmasano, so what we're trying to say is, it, and going off of what Mr. Welch just stated, is that oh. whether a insurance carrier, a health insurance carrier, approves or disapproves of care being provided, we're not going to allow that kind of information yeah. to be uh, in, come into a um, medical malpractice trial. That's that's really the import of what this bill has to say. Correct. Okay, but in in going on from there, the problem with that is that uh, the it's, it's my understanding you can't sue a, uh, a healthcare insurance provider for they have from what I understand they have blanket immunity from suit for for not paying for health care. Isn't that correct? I'd have to check on that, but I believe so for purposes. Okay. Thank you. We've got a couple other people I want to get talking on this right quick. So everybody covered, then come up together. Who was Bill Clark and uh, Andy Owen? If y'all would let them have the mic. Thank y'all. Thank you. Come on, have a seat, uh, Bill. Mr. Owen. Mr. Chairman, this is becoming something of a habit, isn't it? <laughs> Not a good one. I, I hope there are no cameras. Two of y'all together? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and, and I, a I, odd I, couple. I, I'm not sure about Mr. <laughs> Mr. Clark, but um, I, I feel like that, that everyone that's commented and has, has hit the nail on the head that the fact that uh, these these uh, determinations are made administratively over administrative issues should never factor into 
a medical malpractice case, which I've been defending doctors for 30 years now, and there's no place for that, absolutely. And um, so that's that's so you're where for we the bill. are. So we are, yes. So. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, Bill Clark, on behalf of the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association. As Representative Oliver observed, uh, we are trying to work with the Medical Association uh, on a number of issues, including this one uh, this year. This bill is an AMA model bill that they're trying to get all the state medical associations to pay to pass. It's called the Physician Shield Act. Um, we're more interested in shielding patients uh, from negligent care, um, but we understand where they want to go with this bill, and that is to say that payment criteria shouldn't be used as evidence of medical malpractice, that payment criteria, payment standards don't have anything to do with standard of care. Conceptually, we support that. Uh, we are concerned that the language needs to be fleshed out a little further to make clear that if it gets in the area of quality of care, uh, then that is a standard, you can call it a payment standard, but if it deals with quality of care, uh, then it otherwise would be admissible into evidence. What we've agreed with the Medical Association and MagMutual to do today is to, to come before you, uh, ask the committee to consider the bill, um, but pledge to you that we will continue working uh, either on an amendment uh, going towards rules or the floor right. and certainly over on the Senate side. Um, but we are concerned about the blending of medical uh, care or quality of care standards with payment standards. Um, and if that can be addressed in the future, uh, we'd like to do that on this bill. Very good. Well, Go thank you both. Don't think there will be. <laughs> All right. We have a uh, we cut off further uh, public input. The bill is now in the breast committee. We have a motion to pass. Is there a second? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have a second. Uh, we have any discussion on the motion? Amendments. We do have amendments. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have a couple of uh, Jill Travis amendments. Um, <laughs> Clarification. Cl Clarification. It'll be crystal clear uh, after these. All right. Line 27 and line 30, uh, we're doing the same thing in both places, and that's after the word any, uh, inserting the word civil action for, and uh, deleting the word case uh, prior to the period. So in both places, it would read in any civil action for medical malpractice or product liability period. There's a second to the uh, amendment. Second. It's been second in discussion on the amendment. All right, we take the amendment up first. Uh, we have a the amendment. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think. Jacob's amendment number one. Uh, it, we'll take that up. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. The amendment carries. Any further amendments? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Mr. Mayor. Um, after hearing testimony from Bill Clark. Because we're trying to limit this to medical treatment, quality of care, and best practices, um, where it's mentioned, um, line 12, shall not include criteria relating to medical treatment, quality of care, or best practices uh, management. I think if we could add those words there. What are your words? Get, get, get clear for me. For quality me. of care, where it says criteria relating yes, to medical treatment, treatment, quality of care, comma, quality of care, or best practices. Quality of care or best practices? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Is that in line 12, 14, and 21? That's what I'm looking at. 12, 14, and 21. That is correct. We got. You'll have it three times then. Right. Let, me, let me read it. Please. Okay. I'll take care of that if you don't mind. Number 11 and 12 will read as follows. Criteria means criteria relating to administrative procedures and shall not include criteria relating to medical treatment, comma, quality of care, or best practices. That would be a number 13 and 14 guideline, meaning a guideline relating to administrative procedure and shall not include guidelines relating to medical treatment, comma, quality of care, or best practices, period. And then down at number 20 and 21, standard means a standard relating to administrative procedures and shall not include 
standards relating to medical treatment, comma, quality of care, or best practices. Does that properly state your amendment? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second to that amendment? Any discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Fleming. I'd like to ask Mr. Owens if he thinks that amendment changes the intent of what you're trying to do. Ms. Evans, do you have yours push, Ms. Evans? I have a further amendment at the appropriate All right. time. Um, yes, sir. Mr. Weldon? I could pose a question to the chair. Get your mic, please. If I could pose a question to the chair and yes, possibly to uh, council. Um, criteria relating to, and on line 12 it says, criteria relating to medical treatment, and then comma, quality of care or best practices. Shouldn't that also include in there in the provision of medical care? I think that is the, the uh, overall intent of the provision because you have, you have it really in three different places. Um, Anybody want to chime Chairman? in? Yes, sir. Uh, it, it would strike me that, uh, you know, if I understand the intent of the author's <laughs> amendment, if he's seeking to do what I think he's seeking to do, then I think you would need to do the same thing on lines 12 and 14 um, because the effective language um, of the bill there on lines 22 through 24 involves both guidelines and criteria. That's what it does. That part of it. Yeah. Relating to health care. That's where the terms are used as specifically regulations related to health care. So I think it would be Superfluous to have that added up in most part of the definitions. Mm -hmm. If you have it down here, this is the this is the terms, criteria, guideline, and standard being defined. And then you have those terms used down here as it relates to health care. Okay. So it'd be superfluous to add it again. Well, then criteria, then on line 12, for example, shouldn't we put quality of care or best practices um, after the word to in line 12? So it's criteria relating to quality of care or best practices in providing medical treatment. So you want to move it up to the after two on the... And then same thing in uh, mm -hmm. line 14 and 21. fine just uh, let's go ahead with the particular amendment we had a second to the amendment any further discussion on the amendment all in favor of the uh, who was it? Uh, neighbors Mabry. amendment uh, signify by saying aye. aye opposed like sign motion carried Ms. Evans thank you mr. Oh, chairman yeah. my amendment is to strike the word other on line 24 and to add at the end of line 30, comma, without competent expert testimony establishing the appropriate standard of care. Okay. 
and the purpose of the amendment is to make clear that that second sentence of subsection B, um, just as the first sentence, that if you have expert testimony establishing the appropriate standard of care, could apply as well. Because right now it looks like that second one is. Let me get your amendment stated. Sure. On line 24 at the very end, striking the word others, what would read, without competent expert testimony establishing the appropriate standard of care? Yes. And what was the other part of your amendment? At the end of line 30. Let's, let's do one at a time. Is okay. that cool to go with, with this one? I'm sorry? Line of end 30. Okay, excuse me. Go ahead. End of line 30. At the end of line 30, add the words, without competent expert testimony establishing the appropriate standard of care. Okay. I know. Not really related. <clears throat> I'm going to rule your amendment proposed as being out of order as two different items. If you want to restate your amendments. Sure, I'm happy to divide them, Mr. Right. Chairman. The first amendment would be to strike the word other on line 24. It just seems like extra words to me. The uh, Evans First Amendment, uh, line 24, striking other at the very end, has been seconded. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. And you're, you have another amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The second amendment would be to add at the end of line 30, without competent expert testimony, establishing the appropriate standard of care. Do we have a second to that amendment? Second. It's been seconded. Is there further discussion on Evans' Second Amendment? If not, we'll call the question. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Are there any further amendments? Uh, that language we just added at the end of line 30, does that also need to be placed at the end of the, sen the sentence on line 27 where we struck the, line, the word case? Yeah. That's what's going back to the first part of it. Yes, okay, I see it. Got it. All right. No further amendments, no further discussion. The chair will call for the question. The main motion is a do pass as a now a committee substitute with amendments. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. A post like sign. One no. All right. Two no's. <laughs> Chair, chair rules. <laughs> chair rules. The motion carries. Thank you. We hate trying to do these things in full committee. You see why? When our next bill is Mr. Benton, one thirty-three. All right, Mr. Benton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate uh, being allowed to come before the full committee. Uh, Bill, House Bill 133 is coming to you as a uh, substitute. Um, it has to do with uh, uh, family cemeteries that have become landlocked and members of the family cannot get permission from the surrounding landowners uh, to be able to get to the cemetery to keep it up. And so uh, uh, the bill was, was heard before your subcommittee and uh, we used uh, a lot of the language that the subcommittee proposed and the chair proposed. And we have now what we think is a, a very good bill uh, pertaining to uh, cemetery access. Okay. Let me ask a question. How, how prevalent is this problem without uh, going to a lot of areas? Have you, have you experienced this problem? Uh, we've experienced several problems in my home county, but I, I do know that there are a lot of um, family cemeteries out there that are landlocked that if they knew that they had, an, uh, had a uh, – a method to be able to get into the cemeteries, I think that they would uh, 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 take take this avenue. All right. Ms. Uh, Oliver? We've heard a good bit about this, Mr. Chairman, and I'm happy to make a motion at the appropriate All right. time. Any further discussion? Uh, anyone else want to address the committee? I don't think there was anyone else. 
If not, we'll close off further public input, and uh, the bill is now in the breast of the committee. On House will, I mean, the chair will entertain a motion on House Bill 133. Move to pass and second it. Any further discussion? If not, we'll call the main question. Do pass on House Bill 133. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Thank you. Mr. Dutton. We have saved the best for last, Mr. Dutton. <laughs> Chairman, I appreciate the time, members of the committee. Oh, well, and two, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> next, next to the last, excuse me. <laughs> Come ahead. We'll go ahead, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the time. Um, I bring the sub LC295513S. Uh, brought this through subcommittee and uh, would bipartisan help. We, uh, I think we got the language where we needed it. Um, it's a, a measure to repeal the emergency power in a declared state of emergency um, to, to be able to confiscate firearms in the, in the declared emergency. Let me ask a question. Why do we need all of 38-3-37 that you're proposing here? Um, the, uh, the reason for that is actually, um, it was recommended by legislative council by Ms. Chill that, that we actually define what's already, uh, in other places and other code and, and state law to where it is actually, you know, clear as far as, you know, how it, why do we need that, that code section? Yeah. I mean, you, got a lot of stuff, you got a lot of stuff in here that doesn't really pertain to what we're looking at. Talk about issues of, uh, regarding registration of firearms. You got uh, issues carrying weapon and promulgating a rule regulation prohibiting carrying of firearms. I don't I don't know why we're addressing that under this section of the law. That's my question. Why are we doing that? Well, the uh, the concern is that under a declared state of emergency that issue of being able to to actually impose the the restriction of, of requiring a, a firearms license or we're talking about emergency not not things building up to the emergency right. maybe for years you're talking about people having obligations under the law for whether it be a rural regulation of a local government or of course, they've been pretty much preempted, but even state level rural regulations or law pertaining to the requirements of uh, registration of the firearm. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm questioning why we need that when we're dealing with the emergency powers section. And I recall being in this body when we passed this legislation back after 9-11 mm -hmm. because there was always the unknown what may happen in the future at that point in time. So I'm just... I'm just beyond understanding why we have that uh, also being addressed as far as this long section of 38-3-37. We have a question, I believe, from, is that you wave? Okay. Ms. Evans, have you got yours? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, mm -hmm. and for working with me earlier on some things. Can you... Uh, tell me, remind me, I guess, perhaps, what code section is that gives you comfort that police officers continuing to try to keep the peace on the streets, even though it may be during a national emergency, are still able to confiscate firearms in the course of their regular duties to arrest and keep the peace? I'm not, I'm not sure of the actual code section, but my understanding was it's already in law um, and it would be unaffected by any of that we have in this legislation. And do you think that it would hurt the intent of this bill if we were to provide me and, and perhaps there are others that have the con same concern that if we added some language, I'm not sure exactly where it would go unless otherwise provided by law? No, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that would be a problem. Well, we had some of that already in the bill before. Sure, <laughs> it's been struck through. Okay, I think Ms. Travis just calmed me down. Thanks. Ms. Travis. 
I feel like we'll, that res, the reserved right, the reserved right for law enforcement should be under B subsection one right there because it limits it only to which was not prohibited by law at the time immediately prior to the declaration of a state of emergency. All right. Any further input or questions to me of the uh, presenter? If not, we will close all further input. Discussion among the committee? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. Second. Motion do pass. Any further discussion of the motion? Any other motions? If not the chair calls for the motion. All all approved, do pass. Signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. All right. Chair rules the motion passes. Last we have is yours, Mr. Weldon. Yours is 504, is it? 520. 520, excuse me. Yes, sir. Hmm? Oh, it is your pen. You go ahead, please, sir. Mr. Chairman, um, this bill is brought for the purposes of uh, uh, th there's a um, there's lots of lawsuits out there right now between cities and counties. Between cities and counties, and uh, what this uh, and it, the, the the dispute is over the uh, local option sales tax provisions. And what this uh, does is uh, uh, provides that in the event the Supreme Court uh, makes a decision that would strike down the uh, sales tax, uh, the local option sales taxes, that they would have some time to uh, deal with how they address the, the issue yeah. uh, in baseball arbitration. Now and that's with it. Sir? May I help you with it? Yes, sir, if you would, I please. Think what we're doing is the fact that there is, the because uh, I piloted the changes in the sales tax, the local option sales tax to set up the criterion for resolving that through baseball arbitration. There's challenges being made by some jurisdictions uh, questioning whether that is a constitutional delegation of powers uh, that is improper as far as the courts. Uh, one one local jurisdiction has struck down that challenge. There is still one pending, I believe. But the question was, if it were to happen and we run out of the normal statutory time, in effect what you'd have is a lapse of the local option sales tax under the ex law that existed prior to the change. So to put some uh, suspenders with the belt here, we want to recognize if, if that did happen, these jurisdictions will have 120 days from the conclusion of that appellate process to resolve their uh, having a, a certificate filed with the uh, uh, Department of Community Affairs, and that's the purpose of it. Yes, sir, Mr. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the furthermore, the um, I, I'm not going to be able to vote on the bill, but just wanted to clarify for uh, because we're representing some some of these cities um, in the litigation, but just to clarify that there is the issue of um, the Superior Court under the statute would normally uh, submit the certificate to the department or to the commissioner um, after they render the decision, but if the Supreme Court were to rule that base bar arbitration is not constitutional, the um, th then there would essentially be no resolution for those particular cities and laws. And another section of the statute contemplates that the certificates expire at the end of last year so they um, so the certificates that existed for lost um, are in effect until the end of last year and then now that the city some of these cities and counties have engaged in the baseball arbitration provision they've relied on that possibly to their detriment going forward and um, and, it, and so this provision should fix that if, it, if it's adopted all right any further Questions of the presenter? If not, we will close off debate. Is there a motion? 
on uh, House Bill 520. Do pass. Motion is do pass. There's second and second. Any discussion on the motion by the committee? I have are there any are there any amendments I have proposed? A couple of amendments. All right. State your amendments. Uh, on line 16, where the word city is, I think the appropriate term of, of art is qualified municipality. You state that as amendment? Yes, sir. All right. The amendment is to strike city and place in there instead qualified municipality. Any second to the motion? This motion seconded. Discussion on the motion. Chair will call for that question. All in favor signify by saying aye as to the uh, Powell motion, uh, First Amendment. Aye. 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 All right. Any further amendments? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, on line 17, I, once the process is completed, I don't know why we need another four months. I would suggest that we change 120 days to 60 days. And I make that in the form of a motion. I think that if you've ever worked with local governments, <laughs> they are not always that quick, especially your larger jurisdictions. I would urge that we just go ahead and allow it for the four-month time within that. that time. I'll withdraw that. Thank you. I'm dealing with one right now that has the Fulton County and I think it's 14 separate uh, cities. A little difficult to get everything coordinated. Uh, and I've got a Third Amendment. All right. State or third. Second now. Second Amendment now. All right. Uh, on line 19 after commissioner mm -hmm. uh, and keeping in mind what uh, uh, yes. you know what Andy Welch said is uh, I would add if such a certificate has not been filed by the Superior Court after the word commissioner would that be needed if you had already filed a commissioner I mean a, a one that's accepted by the court well, the, the, the issue, I think, is is that the code section, as we are amending it, says that it's up to uh, the local government to file their distribution certificate with the commissioner. And if it's already been filed by the superior court, are they technically in violation? Yes. I mean, we want to Would you want to say just if a, if a certificate has not been previously filed? Yes, sir. That would be fine. Okay. So the, the man would read comma after commissioner if a certificate has not been previously filed. That would be it? Yes, sir. I'll second it. All right. That's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to amend? Powell Amendment number two. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Like sign. Motion carries. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you being here today. Oh. Oh, there you go. The main question. I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. I'm trying to get upstairs to the main question is back on House Bill 520. Motion is due pass as amended committee substitute. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed like sign. Thank you. I'll bring them up. All right, good.